Um, yeah, last time I was here, I kind of mentioned that my beard has changed colour and it's definitely no longer even really kind of, this picture is not appropriate. So we will change we'll that at the next event, yes, or we'll dye it either way. Um, but my name is Fabian Thorpe and as it mentions here, I'm the Business Development Director of Pixelute. Um, and for me, that really means that I always think of myself as being very commercially minded. And you don't often find, especially in strategic agencies that lean towards creative disciplines, you don't often find money people in there, unless they are the ones issuing the invoices when it's time to get paid. But one of the things that we realize with businesses, especially, is that when people come, especially to have a look at their marketing or how their growth um, strategy is going to be, a lot of the time we are very emotional in our choices without thinking about how um, the coins are actually going to work, um, about how the pennies are going to work. When I was very young, I used to, um, I had, I can, if I could tell you how many different new business ideas I've had, um, we would be here for many hours. And every time I'd have a new idea, I simply say to myself, this is such a fantastic idea, and in my head I'd be like, don't worry, it's going to happen. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. I, I didn't really plan and map things out when I was younger. And it wasn't just lack of experience, it's because many times we feel our ideas are the best ideas in the market. Many times we feel as if there is nobody can do what we are saying we can do like the way we can do it. The challenge is, and especially if we start to focus on customer experience, is that that attitude is great to get you kick-started, but the actual fact is when you are identifying your customer, now more than ever, the customer is so educated in the services they are looking for that your approach has to be so much more tailored. And that's really what I'm going to look at in my brief presentation with you today. The title of it is... The title of it is Where is the Love? Where is the Love? And I really wanted a picture of like two people separating and turning their backs on each other as if to say <laughs> we're no longer together. But this is how I kind of feel when I'm speaking to clients sometimes and hearing about what they have as an offering. One of the challenges you have when you sit down and ask someone what is it your business does, they speak from the viewpoint of what it is I have to offer someone as opposed to what it is my client is looking for. That's a lot of times where our focus is. And I believe that the age we are living in now, that has to be flipped on its head. If you are interested in going to business, providing any service, giving any product, your first point of call has to be, what exactly does my customer need? <coughs> and not just, what do I have for my customer? Um, <coughs> I'm going to touch on a few things. So it says here, Customers are less loyal and far less trusted due to the financial crisis and in banking, as an example. The, the problem we have now is that it is not good enough to simply say, this is what I do as a service. Because everybody is a skeptic. Why? Time and time again, the institutions which have been set up as the safe havens in society, so the banks, lawyers, education, Year after year, new scandals arise, new problems arise, there's massive shift in legislation, and what's happened is that before, whereas in the everyday, you and I will be walking down the street, and some of us don't even like, does anyone that doesn't like to watch the news? Just be honest. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people now, they, they, they don't like to watch the news because they feel like it's a similar rhetoric. So the fact they don't like to watch the news means that even though some news, there's a whole load of tabloid at the bit, Sometimes a really interesting economics or business section has to die as well because I don't want to see the news. I don't want to list through everything that is bad happening to go and see what might actually interest me. So the challenge you have now is that people are becoming disinterested in news because they, they're not happy with propaganda. And now it comes to a stage where the trust level has gone. So when you are coming to a client, no matter how good your service is, you now have to overcome this underlying fact that I do not trust what it is that you're presenting. Because if the bank could say steal PPI from me, if 
a lawyer could malpractice me, if, if all of the institutions which I've invested in are not working, why is it when I'm coming to my service am I going to trust you? And this is one of the challenging things for businesses right now, is to understand that it is simply not good enough to have your offering as a service, you now have to tap into the trust element when it comes to your customers. How are they going to trust what it is that you are saying and how you are able to deliver it? Customers have more power than ever before thanks to social media, easy online comparisons, shopping, and the proliferation of choices. Now this is true. How many of us, as soon as we're about to do something, go online and check it out first? Mm -hmm. Check out and see the comparison. You no longer just walk into Curry's and buy a laptop. Anyone just literally, I need a laptop and you just walked into Curry's and bought the first thing you saw? It starts way, way, the process starts way before that and it normally starts with this device in your hand or your iPad or whichever one it is because there is so much information on there that in order for you to, to, to stand out amongst your competitors, you have to be aware of where it is you're ranking. We have a client that is a online um, consumer electronics. So they sell everything from iPads to phones to laptops. And when I went to their offices, um, I was expecting to see, um, you know, stockpiles, bunch of videos, um, different displays, consumer needs. And all I saw when I went in there was about just screens and screens and screens, data, 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 figures, figures, figures. So I sat down with the director and I said to him, okay, so how do you decide on what products are happening? You know, what are your user reviews like? What do you promote? And he says, user reviews? Promotions? What are you talking about? I said, well, how do you know what you're going to push? If there's a new camera, or if it's a Samsung S8 or the new S7, like, what, you know, iPhone 7. Which one are you going to, how do you know? He goes, no, 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 I don't do that. I said, well, how do you do your business? He goes, I simply go online and I search Amazon and I find whatever the cheapest product is on there then I send out a thousand emails to suppliers and try and supply it cheaper than whatever the cheapest point is in there. Completely 100% price driven. That's all he cares about. And he has built a software which literally combs the internet every day and as soon as the price changes and if you're a supplier of him and you're supplying him iPhones and you've been a supplier for five years and then on Thursday, a new supplier comes out, they advocate it for £10, an email goes to you to say, unless you can match a £10 price, you're no longer my supplier. Heartless. Like, like literally cold-blooded, no interest. But the fact is that he is completely driven by where his customer is searching. And he's made the decision to say, I'm going to be a completely price oriented business. Now, we're going to, as you go through the presentations later, you're going to realise that there are some good aspects to that, but what we need is a balance. We cannot be focused in one area, especially as small businesses. And we're going to talk about how it is that you stand out in relation to your customer experience. Next up, too much noise, not enough information. One of the challenges for growing businesses now is that with the advent of what I call mass social media. Now, social media has been around for years but never like it is now. I mean, seriously, how many platforms are there? Snapchat, Twitter now sounds old. Um, Instagram, Facebook sounds old. Like, if I'm guessing, then we had Vine died. Um, it lived a bit, then died. Um, Pinterest. Pinterest, it, 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 the list goes on. And businesses are trying to understand and navigate to say, Based on my customer, where is the best place for me to showcase what I do in order to attract? So there's a whole social science as to who uses what platform for what reasons. For example, there's a very good chance that if I am going to be attracting someone, say, 40 plus, the platforms that I'm going to be interested in are Facebook. Because ordinarily, even <coughs> my name is on Facebook. But if I'm going to be dealing with 16 to 21 year olds, where am I going to be looking at? Snapchat, Instagram. Instagram and Snapchat. But the challenge is that not just those areas, but also my language changes depending on what platform it is that I'm speaking. So what a lot of businesses have a problem doing is that they just think, right, we're not doing anything in social media right now, let's just push out information, push, push out information. 
and they write a blog and they, they send a link on Twitter, they share it on Facebook, they share it on Instagram, they share it on LinkedIn, they share it on everything. But hold on a minute, those are completely different markets. They're going to receive that information in different ways. When I see a link, when I see a picture, a few <coughs> words and a short, poetry link on Instagram, I'm thinking, I can't be bothered to click that. I'm not going to figure out how to click that through. Instagram for me is a video, hopefully some words on it, and about five or six really good, good tones on there. And, and please don't flood me with 100 hashtags either. Like, do, you, do, you, do you understand what I mean? We are behaving in a certain way based on the platform. And you have to understand that it simply isn't good enough to just share content. Your content sharing has to be strategic and has to relate directly to your audience. So it's not about just making noise. Because what happens when you make too much noise? It turns into confusion. Nobody's very clear as to what your message is and what it is that you're trying to convey. Understand your customer's full range of choices. Um, it's challenging when you speak to potential clients who have no respect for their competition. What's even more challenging is when they have no respect for their customers. And that's really hard to convey sometimes when you're sitting down with someone, especially in our discovery consultations, is that while we ask questions in relation to their clients, a prospective client, it's, ama it's amazing how little someone who's invested to go into business has taken time out to figure out what their clients actually want. These, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, we met someone who was in the health food space and they were certain that they just wanted to deliver really good quality health food and recipes. So we said, okay, where do people who are really interested in health food look for information? And who do they best respond to? And the answer back was, well, I've got really good recipes and I think that they should follow my recipes. And they're like, okay, but are you, are you necessarily the best person? Let's have a cross look and see what successful channels are and how they present. Would you consider getting another presenter? Absolutely not, because I make really good recipes and this is really good. Some people have completely blocked out. If you are in business solely for self-gratification, you really need to consider again. Because it really isn't a service, you really are just promoting yourselves. And that is what now the cycle or the um, environment we live in now has completely changed. Even you see it with celebrities. Celebrities no longer just go to promote themselves. They change like a whim. If, if I saw girls wearing um, <coughs> camo, camo pants with heels, for some reason they, I thought they were gone, then they came back. And then for every picture I saw on Instagram was camo pants with heels. And then that changed to romper suits, then it changed to this, then it changed to that. People change like the wind. They need to know what's hot and they move with it. Why? Because we live in a like generation. Wherever the likes are happening, that's where we want to address to. It's about balance, but at the same time, it's so important to know that you have to understand your customer's full range of choices. Super, super important. Um, track key customers' experiences. Um, one of the things I say, for, especially if you have an app, or you've mentioned that you're trying to develop an app, um, also you've mentioned that you're interested in property, um, and you want to develop a property business, it's really good, there's some property professionals here, I know you're writing, but I'm talking to you now, so look up. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm saying there's some property professionals here, I'm giving you a heads up, it's well worth networking. <laughs> right, that's just a, that's a heads up. But, but what's really interesting is that you should take time to go out to view it. Even if they're properties you're not going to get, go out to view and understand what's a good customer experience, what's a bad customer experience. Go to Foxton's, then go to Bearstow Eves, then go to the guy who's just got a website and just not quite sure what it is. And detail, understand your key customer's experiences. Because what you want to do is you want to reflect what is good in a situation based on what you do. How can you make an assumption in your business? <coughs> um, we, we have, I know that Leo was very... Um, what's the word, very um, calm about what he actually does as a business. Um, and I don't want to speak too much about it, but you know, 
a very successful and growing business that has multiple levels. But what's very key to that, and what I have noticed in when I've seen his business run, whether he's here or he's away, is the customer experience. And that's based on his personnel that he has in place. So even if it's someone that's super stressed out, there's a maintained level of customer experience that has to happen throughout. We had a challenge today because some of our guests came early. The customer experience wasn't very good downstairs. I need to have a conversation with them about it. But it means that at least I know and I can do something about it. So this is so important. Understand the road that your customer is walking through in order to be able to deliver what you're doing. Then he says, feel diverse customer teams. This is really interesting. What, one of the things, and um, the um, example is given by General Electric and a few other quite big and large multinational companies, is they realize that people in the back office and people in customer services, they're like two completely different teams. I started off in banking and I worked for a, a bank called JP Morgan when I first went into the city. And it was tribes. You know, in the banking system, it's tribal. The front office guys, the traders, they, okay, so you guys know, they're the ones with the Ferraris and the Porsches and they come in and they, they literally put their foot up on the desk, they make a million pounds in 30 seconds and they chill out for the afternoon. Then you have the middle office. So the middle office are kind of like, they're supporting the trades, but if you ever call them back office, they give you a slap. They'd be like, no, we don't do that. We're kind of like halfway in the middle through this. And then you have the back office, which are seen as almost like the engine room of the bank. They're the ones who have zero respect for the front office because they don't think they do any work. They have partial respect for the middle office because they run the back, but then it's tribal and everything was really tribal. I was very an interpersonal type person, so I would always go to the front office, try and get to know the guys, talk to the back office, try and get to know them, and then very soon people would say to me, well actually, you know, you shouldn't really be hanging out with me. <laughs> You're not a trader, you can't even afford a round of drinks with those guys. <laughs> You shouldn't be doing this, and they wanted to pigeonhole me. <clears throat> so when banks started to realise this, what they started to do was, in the grant schemes, they started to ensure that if you went through the graduate programme, you had to go to every department. So you may start off in New York, then you move to London, and you do uh, three months in HR, you do three months in front office, you do three, because they wanted to create a more balanced workforce that had respect for other departments. And that's very important, even as a small business or as a small team, feel diverse customer teams means that you sit down with your customers, understand, have dialogue, even explain what's going on in your business. A lot of times businesses are very guarded to customers, they're like, oh, things are wonderful, we are doing very good things today and we're making lots of money. And inside they're like, they're literally eating pot noodle every day trying to keep the, the doors open. But sometimes when you share with your customers the challenges you're facing, Empathy, and you're going to hear more about that, comes into play. And that's a very key point. And this is something that is almost a center for what we do as a business at Pixel, is we preach empathy. We preach the importance of understanding what someone else is going through. Um, then it says learn together with your customers. Um, one very interesting thing, we have a, um, a company that we work with called um, Pi Diametrics. And um, if you were at our first event, uh, John Earnshaw spoke there and he's going to be speaking at one of the, an amazing guy, super, super dynamic in the way in which he works and, and how he delivers about analytics. And one of the key things that he did is that we were having some really big corporate accounts that we're trying to tackle. And what you find with larger accounts, it takes a lot longer to prepare for them. So we sat down with him and we said, listen, we need a new kind of reporting for this client and we're not sure how to do it. And he's kind of said, he goes, look, we've been working on this thing for about six months, but we don't know if it'd be any good, but let's just give it a try. And at the end of the presentation, I was like, oh my days, this is amazing. This is going to like revolutionize everything. And he said to me, he says, oh, that's really good. But what we need to do is we need to get together with the client and break down what it is we're doing before we attempt to launch it. And I thought, that's really brave. Because if you were a designer, would you sit down with your customer and say to them, hi, I'm really thinking of doing this really cool dress. Would you want to sit with me and we sew it and build it together? In some cases, you'd be like, hold on, this is my creative thing. I want to present this. But when you take a client along the customer experience journey with you, especially when you're doing something new, the client feels as if they are invested into what you're doing. 
And people now, customers now, want to be a part of the process. They want a, they want a sense of ownership in whatever you're doing. So you have to find new ways to bring people in in relation to ownership of what you're doing moving forward. Now, <coughs> just about to wrap up now. <coughs> Focus on what <coughs> excuse me, customers will want tomorrow. As Steve Jobs and Richard, I don't know who these guys are, but I've heard of him. I kind of know him. Um, <laughs> uh, did so exclusively. What's really interesting with um, Steve Jobs and, and, and Richard Branson themselves is that they are really what you call forward thinkers when you think about what their business model was. Very simple ideas, but thinking forward. Apple was birthed out of, this is, the PCs are too restrictive. It's not, I don't believe this is what people want to do. I think people want to share more. I think it's more about the individual. I think that nobody wants to feel like they're a lemming. I think that they want to, and so birth from that idea has now become um, probably, if not one of, definitely top three richest cash companies in the world. Um, Apple, Apple is there. Uh, but its challenges that Apple has faced in the last 10 years has because consumers have been so used to dynamic innovation that when you did get an iPhone, that the only difference was an extra megapixel on the camera, you thought to yourself, you're cheating me. <laughs> I, I'm used to leaps of innovation. Yeah. That's what you've told your customers, that's what you've sold people, and now you're charging me more and you're giving me a hop of innovation. <laughs> <laughs> and Samsung does a leap and then you do a hop of innovation. And after a while, people just aren't going to buy it. And even a company as massive as Apple faces those challenges. Exact same thing with Virgin completely revolutionized the way in which we travel in the air. You know, I remember being younger and traveling um, on holiday with my parents and American Airlines was like, man, very special airline at the time. And then we went on Virgin. Oh my days, that was the first airline when you actually got coloring books, you actually got pencils, they actually cared about what kids did on the flights. They gave you stuff and they didn't take it back at the end of it. You got to keep it, you got to keep the little toothpaste, you got to keep it. And they were the ones who pioneered a different way of thinking. But the same thing with Virgin, is it came to a stage where they were like, you can't just sell us this, what's more? And then they had to kind of go to the drawing book and think, okay, how are we gonna revolutionize our trains? How are we gonna really revolutionize beauty? How are we gonna revolutionize money? How are we gonna be a franchise that when people associate with us, they associate innovation? And that's a really key thing that I just wanna leave with you is that, the customer experience is about not only innovation, but understanding and knowing what your customer wants. It's super, super key. Um, thank you. Cheers.